love and respect thanks for tuning in guys i got a quick video today we're just going to read some anthropological books just something to uh remember and remind everybody about ancient america and its people dodge to hijack with any assumptions and again this is not me making anybody so-called black these are scholarly sources you can verify real quick we begin with this book it says here from Frederick A. Peterson, it's called Ancient Mexico, an introduction to the pre-Hispanic cultures, maps and drawings by Jose Luis Franco. This is from 1859. We go here to page 39. It says here, the magicians, a fluorescent cultish epic, a strange people whom we might possibly call magicians had a basically middle culture background, but with some peculiar shamanistic ideas. We assume that their evolution was much of the same as that of the first farmers, all right? So I want to show you guys what they're talking about, these magicians, right? On the next page, it says here, studies of skeletons of the magicians, all right? So-called magicians supplemented by comparison with figurines that they made, all right, from themselves, show that they had a certain adenoidism in the mouth, artificially deformed heads, short legs, low and obese bodies with feminine characteristics and that they practice dental mutilation, a substratum with negroid characteristics that intermingled with the magicians lead some anthropologists to speculate on negroid immigration into Mexico. All right? Speculation of migration just because they're finding so-called negroid characteristics in these statues and in these skeleton specimens right so touch the hijack just want to start out with this book guys and throughout many anthropological books you'll see that it's something they have to address you know when they're finding these old mech heads and all these so-called negroid <laughs> statues and uh, skeletons that resemble so-called negro people they do have to address the elephant in the room, so they come out with their speculations, all right? But this is the true old world. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Welcome. Let's continue. So uh, this is the cover of the book, uh, Studios Arqueológicos y Ethnográficos. So let's get right into it. All right, so I went to uh, right to page 23, chapter 5, and it says here, Los Negroides en América, or the Negroes in America. All right, so this is the part that I'm going to translate. So take a look at it. So I, what I did is I copy pasted this and brought it to Google Translate. All right, let's take a look. So it translates to, it says, Several isolated but concordant facts allow us to suppose that before the formation and development of the three great ethnographic groups of which we have just spoken, the Pampas, Indians and Caribs, a large part of America was occupied by an inferior race of Negroid type. Okay, The conquerors found scattered throughout the New World small tribes that from the first moment were, and continuing, this is what I'm going to translate now, continues, were considered as belonging to the black race. Such were, for example, the Otomi, 
from Mexico, the snails from Haiti, the Ara Arcajos from Cutara, the Arabos from Orinoco, the Porsehis and the Malayas from Brazil, the Manatus, Quito, the Chuanas, the Darien, etc. The American nations or outlines of a national history of the ancient and modern nations of North and South America says of this wide Western hemisphere, let us retrace the history of all the nations dwelling here. Let us recall the memory. So they talk. There were formerly in America as now tribes of all complexions as elsewhere, yellowish, olive, coppery, tawny, reddened, brown, incarnate, or white, and even blackened or negro-like. Again, blackened or negro-like. Continue, says, tall and dark, darkish men from 8 to 4 feet in size, called giants and pygmies, men with various frames, skulls, and features of all the sorts found in the Eastern Hemisphere. It says here, American anthropography will teach that there were men of all sizes, features, and complexions in this hemisphere before 1492, notwithstanding the false assertions of many writers who take one nation for the whole American group. The Ushiks, the Puduais, the Parias, the Chongs, etc., were as white as the Spaniards, says 50 such tribes were found in South America, while many tribes of Choco, the Manabis, the Yarudas, and, and etc. were as black as Negroes, right? They were as black as Negroes. All the other shades of brown, tawny, and coppery were scattered everywhere. Cara, let me show you what I see found here and look at the Indian. As you can see, copper color, right? And this is the book again, Mexico a través de los siglos. The cover inside the book when once you get to page 63 and through 67 all right so let's read some small segments of this uh book and what he says about the native mexicans right so we're going to translate this part right here first and it says as a clear trace of the black race we have some little heads of teotihuacan and we've seen a clear type serpentine mask Regarding those little heads, we'll say that in the innumerable tumuli from the ruins of that great city are found between different objects. They are made of clay and end in the neck or appendix. According to Mr. Orozco, they put on the mounds to commemorate the race of everybody. And indeed, examining them carefully, it is observed that they are not formed at illibitum. In comparing them, it is noticed that the artificers copied determined people. Among them are some with a flat nose and lips outgoing, which could not be applied but to individuals of a black race. So he's saying that these little heads are depicting black people. They have black features or copper colored features or so-called Negro features. It is also noticed in the examination of those little heads that belong to known types, while others refer to figures and completely touched strange and different from those raised during the historical times. This proves that previously there were towns with unknown customs and diverse races of those of earlier times. Okay. I think it would suffice to venture the claim of the former existence of the black race, the finding made of little heads of its kind. But for the most part, we have as another test the colossal head of Huayapan. It was discovered in the 1860s in the hacienda of that name, located near San Andres Tustla, Tuxla. That is, in one of the most hot near our Gulf Coast. He found coincidentally in the field, and the curiosity was limited to digging the earth to discover it, leaving it in the hole that had been formed. Head, it is granite, two yards high and with the corresponding proportions. Your type is clearly Ethiopian. And his special headdress and the cuneiform incision that he has on his forehead, and that he remembers some sacred sign of Asia. Alright, so very ancient. And continuing as it says here, but the perem test of the former existence of the black race in our continent is that still his remains are found in him and others speak to us the primitive chroniclers so they're saying that the remnants of these uh, black tribes are still in america and it says such are the caracules of haiti the californiums of the caribbean islands the californiums of the caribbean islands you hear that Argiajos de cutara 
the Aroras, six Yararas of the Orinoco, the Chimos of Guyana, the Munujipas, Jorisigis, and Malayas of Brazil, Negritas, Chuanas, or Guanas of the Isthmus of Darien, the Manalis of Popoyan, the Guatas and Haras of Sahinos from Honduras, the Estuaries of New California, the Black Indians found by the Spaniards in Louisiana. You heard that right, black Indians found in Louisiana by the Spaniards. It says and continues, and the moon eyed and albinos discovered in Panama and destroyed others by the Iroquois. So you see all these uh, tribes that uh, he, this chronicler, knows, this historian, that they were Negro or so called blacks. This book is called An Inquiry into the Distinctive Characteristics of the Aboriginal Race of America by Samuel George Morton. All right, so we're going to go into this book just so we can uh, take a look at what he's saying. So uh, right from the beginning of this book, the author clearly uh, explains to us the, what he's seeing uh, in these regions of the world. All possessed like the long, lank, black hair, the brown or cinnamon colored skin. Again, brown or cinnamon colored skin, the heavy brow, the dull and sleepy eye, the full and compressed lips. Okay, again, full and compressed lips and the salient but dilated nose. And uh, continuing in the very next page, it says here, It cannot be questioned that physical diversities do occur, equally singular and inexplicable, as seen in different shades of color, varying from a fair tint to a complexion almost black. Uh, and this too under circumstances in which climate can have little or no influence. So also in reference to stature, the differences are remarkable in entire tribes, which moreover are geographically approximate to each other these facts however are mere exceptions to a general rule okay so you're saying this is an exception though to a general rule. and do not alter the peculiar physiognomy of the indian which is undividedly characteristics as that of the negro all right so again he's saying that you cannot doubt that the indian undividedly has characteristic of that of the negro for whether we see him in the athletic cherub or carib, right, athletic again, or the stunned chima in the dark Californian, again, dark Californian, or the fair boroa, he is an Indian still and cannot be mistaken for being of any other race. He's not African. He's clearly telling you, even though they have these Negro characteristics and they clearly, you know, like the dark Californian, athletic charves they are not african or from any other place they are indian and cannot be mistaken for being of any other race all right all right so it says here the art of terracotta pottery in pre-columbian central and south america by alexander von wittenau so in this book we find uh this part it says unexpected faces in ancient america the book before us analyzes the racial affinities of people depicted in American sculpture from about 1500 BC to 1500 AD, all right? This book demonstrates that ancient American artists often depicted human subjects realistically enough for us to identify them racially, all right? The evidence shows the presence of well-known old world races in America so-called old world but this is the true old world right we know this right namely white touch the hijack black touch the hijack and yellow so all crayon colors right i am not as sensitive as professor von wooten now is to the fine nuances among the hybrids but like most people i can tell the gross differences among relatively full-blooded mediterranean whites african negroes and far east mongoloids all right so he's basically putting all dark skinned people in this category all right that's the hijack we all grew up with right and of course they're gonna say mediterranean white so they're trying to say what hebrews are white right though so these gross distinctions on the figurines should be obvious to everyone they are denied by many pre-columbianists some of the la latter say that an ancient statuette from mexico showing black skin Kinky hair and a flat nose and thick lips indicates nothing about the composition of the Mexican population during the lifetime of the artist. 
because all the features might be stylistic or imagined. A natural scientist once told me that such a statue represents a mutation. When I informed him that there are hundreds of such representations of different individuals, he replied that the same mutation might reoccur again and again. I have told this story because it brings out the resistance to the self-evident theses of this book, to wit, that our ancient artists have recorded various old world races in pre-Columbian America. All right. So he's letting you know how ignorant people can be saying these are mutations or saying that these are people just painting themselves as black. That's why they look black and, you know, things like that. That's what they, they, they come up with. But there's uh, traces of old world races here is what he's saying. A little bit more ahead in the book, he says, in connection with the question of Negroes, in America, again, we're in the book Unexpected Faces of America, based on the pottery they found there, all right? I should mention also the investigations conducted by the Mexican scientist, Dr. A. D. Garay, on the presence of Negro blood in one of the oldest and most secluded tribes in Mexico, the Lacandones. Dr. D. Garay is the director of the genetic program of the National Commission of Nuclear Energy in Mexico. Wow. His report includes a reference to the sickle cell a malaria-resistant mutant gene usually found only in the blood of black people. Clearly, Negroid representations in America can be identified as early as 1200 to 650 BC, BC, at least in terracotta and other materials known at present. All right, so again, the author wants to remind you, two facts can be drawn from the illustrations in this book. All right, again, we're in and unexpected phases of America. First, the overall presence of some Negroid individuals in several regions of Mesoamerica. All right, these are facts, facts, two facts, all right? Facts, Negroid individuals in several regions of Mesoamerica. And second, the sequence of the colossal Olmec heads unders underscored by the theories of Coe and Clello, namely that the finest sculptural efforts of San Lorenzo come first with not the slightest indication of an artistic evolution leading up to these masterpieces. The implications of the second fact are prodigious. Several distinguished Negro personages and at least one or several first-rate artists complete with extremely well-developed stone sculpture techniques appeared, so to speak, out of the blue on the American continent 3,000 years ago. Up to now, absolutely no reasonable explanation has been given by any scientific professional for this startling event. So what he's telling you is they have not been able to explain or prove that these are Africans or even explain who they are, like where they came from. And the reason is because they are autochthonous to this land, first land out of the primordial waters. They're trying to figure it out. Why is there so-called Negroes over here? So they try to make all these little theories up, but they don't understand this true old world. One fact, however, is absolutely sure that pre-Columbian artists continued to portray individuals of purely Negroid stock. They might have been late descendants of the powerful first wave of Nubian rulers. Might. Now they're calling you Nubian. Now he's saying these were all Nubian. He's already made up his mind, this author, that because he found Negroid people here, that they had to have been Africans that came over here. Because that's his hijacked view of things, right? Out of Africa theory, right? Darwinism and all that. He continues saying, an excellent example of the classic Mayan period of the two Negroes of Copan, mentioned in the previous chapter. The close-up photographs I took of one of them convinces me that the artist had a living not just his historically remembered model to inspire him. All right, so he's saying that it's so real that the person who made it was actually looking at the living person in front of him as he was sculpting it, all right? Perhaps a magician or snake charmer. The second one, although less well-preserved, is also quite definite in its characterization. Any accidental invention by the artist concerning these two figures seems most improbable. The models were, of course, an assortment of diverse beings. They ranged from purely Negroid specimens to individuals in whom only a slight admixture of black blood can be discerned or speculated about. They also run through the whole scale of social differentiations 
from ordinary human beings to obviously higher class personages. The latter, however, never reached again the powerful ruler quality expressed in the colossal Omeheads during the previous pre-classic epic. The greatest variety of Negroid representations is furnished by the classic Veracruz artists. For a purely black type, we might refer to the fair-sized terracotta head in the Stavenhagen collection. An ordinary black girl is depicted with great realism. The silhouette of the sensitively modeled skull coincides exactly with the prognatism diagram shown in Appendix 5. The ethnic evidence of this piece seems to me practically irrefutable, all right? He already knows. He's telling you it's irrefutable. He's an art expert, this guy, all right? The same can be said of the magnificent stone head that is shown on the jacket of this book. This is by far the most interesting object in the excellent Totona collection of the Natural History Museum of New York. The sculpture shows not only strictly Negroid features, but also the typical hairline of the black individual. The uh, this book is called The Ancient Cities of the New World, Travels and Explorations in Mexico and Central America from 1857 to 1882 by Desiree Charney, the London Chapman and Hall, Limited, 1887. As we advance towards the Pyramid of the Sun, fragments of all kinds meet our eyes in every direction. The fields are strewn with pottery, masks, small figures, lairs, ex votos, small idols, broken cups, stone axes, etc. I select for myself some masks which portray the various Indian types with marvelous truth and at times not without some artistic skill, so marvelous truth. Among them are types which do not seem to belong to America, a Negro, and it says here C plate, and I, this is what they have in the next page. This is the plate I guess they're talking about seeing. See. It says, whose thick lips, flat nose, woolen hair, proclaim his African origin. Woolen hair, his African origin. Again, dodge the hijack. Below this, a Chinese head, Caucasian and Japanese specimens, it says there. Heads with retreating foreheads like those displayed at Palenque, and not a few with Greek profiles, it says there. The lower jaw is straight or projecting. The face is smooth or bearded. In short, it is a wonderful medley, indicative of the numerous races who succeeded each other and amalgamated on this continent, which until lately was supposed to be so new and is in truth so old. This is the old world. This All right, so we're in this book now. It's called Researches, Ph Philosophical and Antiquarian concerning the aboriginal history of america by jh mccullough uh, md and this is written in 1829 all right and we're in page 13 we're going to read uh, right from chapter one a little bit and uh, it's regarding on the complexion and physical appearance of the aboriginal nations of america all right right away systematic writers have also considered the native tribes of america as fifth class of the human race, under the distinct term of the copper-colored race. To this term, we have much to object, not only as re respects the Americans, but other nations, from whom it seems to us they have improperly separated by this theoretic distinction. So a little bit more down, he says, we consider, therefore, that the color of the American Indians in general is brown. In general, the color of the American Indians is brown. Who is brown? All right, we're not talking about tans here. All right, because nobody's really black. Who's really black? The color black. All right, like crayon. Again, we therefore consider that the color of the American Indians in general is brown, differing in intensity with various tribes. Intensity, so there's more intense and some or darkness more darker right and less intense or lighter all right according to the tribes and according to various localities but that is almost impossible to say what that brown color principally resembles the cinnamon in our apprehension apprehension the nearest approach to it cinnamon again what does cinnamon look like and who is that who looks like that who has that complexion Though still too inaccurate for general comparison, 
under these circumstances, it seems most correct simply to use the general term brown man who will does. So he's basically saying, I prefer to call them brown men than copper colored men. But, you know, this is what he's pointing out. But what is he really saying? Kind of saying the same thing, right? All right. So we're just going to show a couple of examples of what he's talking about. Right. So it says the Indians near the source of the Peace River are of a swarthy yellow complexion. Swarthy means dark. So dark yellow complexion. <laughs> Mackenzie's Voyage, 195. The complexion of the Quapas, like that of the Choctaws and Creeks, is dark. Again, the complexion of the Quapas, like that of the Choctaws and Creeks, is dark and destitute of anything like the croupiest tinge. Newtall's Travels, page 83. It uh, says here, Baron Humble remarks, if the uniform tint of the skin be more coppery and redder toward the north, it is on the contrary among the Chaimas of the deep brown, inclining to tawny. The denomination of copper-colored men is, could never have originated in equinoctial America to designate the natives. So he's saying that in South America, they're actually more brown than copper. All right? They're more copper towards the North America. That's what Humboldt's opinion is. All right? It says, uh, description of the Orinoco by Gumilla, volume 1, page 107. The color of the Indians on the borders of the Orinoco is so diversified that he could not say nothing of it under one general head. Why Kudus of Brazil are of a darker tint than copper. Darker than copper? That why Judas of Brazil, this is the Southeast History of Brazil, Volume 3, page 671. Though America possesses some dark brown men approaching to black, yet it has been almost universally believed that there were no Aboriginal blacks or Negroes found on this continent. All right, so that's the hijack that we grew up with, right? But from considering the peculiar circumstances under which a black race was found in North America, I hold it more than probable that the common opinion is erroneous. All right? It was false. It's erroneous. Because when you go with research and when you do see that there was so-called black Indians or a black race found in North America, the subject is still in obscurity and belongs to the terra incognita of America laying between the rivers Columbia and Gila. The authorities I have been able to examine respecting the present Negro appearance of the Indians in that region are as follows. All right, so pay close attention. The color of the Indians of the Californians' mission seen by La Peyros, Voyage, Volume 2, 197 and page 212, very nearly approaches that of the Negroes, whose hair is not woolly, and in another place, the color of these Indians, which is that of Negroes. Landorf, who visited San Fran Francisco on the coast of California, confirms the observations of La, La Peyros, for he says in Voyage, page 440, the Indians there are of a very dark complexion, very dark complexion, approaching to black, approaching to black so-called black so-called negro do you remember who you are they're talking about you they have large projecting lips broad flat negro like noses indeed many of their features as well as their physiognomy and almost their color bear a strong resemblance to the negroes what's this water?